Hey guys, it's Nicole, and today we're talking about probably one of the favorite topics that Dee Dee and I have discussed once before, but we're jumping back into that conversation about sex. We're talking about how sex changes over the years. You know, you can compare, should we compare our 20-year-old sex to our 50-year-old sex? And we're also going to talk about what would be the inhibitors that could cause issue in our sex lives. So... I'm glad you're here. Stay tuned. Today, I want to bring a topic to the table and I have poured us a glass of wine and it's going to be a topic for moms and dads. So if there are any little ones listening, we're going to give you a moment to turn down, turn off this podcast or change the channel. But today we're going to be talking about sex through different stages of life. And I really wanted to bring this topic to the table to speak into the lives of women and want to say there's nothing wrong with you because as we start to unpack this, sometimes you might have felt that way or if you get to that stage, you may feel that way. But also to speak into men's lives, to give a glimpse into what's going on in our hearts, what's going on in our minds in different stages of life. So I think the first thing we need to do is acknowledge sex is different in different stages of life. Yeah, 100%. (laughs) You can't even make a comparison, which maybe when people are making comparisons, that causes a lot of damage in that Mm -hmm. connection. You have your sexual relationship before children. And then that changes. It changes with pregnancy. It changes when you have kids. It changes again as kids start to move out of the house. And then as you go through different changes of of life because our bodies are changing, our husband's bodies are changing. And so I wanted us to talk about, um, not necessarily personally on every situation either, because there are some phases of life you and I haven't gone through yet, Mm -hmm. but we've talked to people who have. And just give us space to open up the conversation to start talking through this. I would say though, the biggest, the initial change in our, in our sex life that I experienced was after having kids. Mm-hmm. Well, one of the things before you have kids there, there is a little bit of a, well, let's say right after marriage, like right in that time, or for some, it started before marriage. There's a time that you're starting to what feels like there's an excitement of, of doing something new and different. So you start experiencing things that are new and in new places, Mm -hmm. you know, trying, trying different things. And there's a freedom that comes with that. Mm -hmm. Um, So to compare, although we do know that keeping things fresh 22 years into marriage is so incredibly important, but there's, it's so different from having something that's new versus something that is comfortable. And so there's a change in mindset during those times. Yeah, and a lot of change is happening in the body. So early on, before kids, you have more freedom. There's nobody else in the house. You can sleep when you, whenever you want. So therefore, like, if you're missing some sleep, Mm -hmm. it's it's not that big of a deal. Yes. But after kids, you're really tired and your body hurts in weird ways that you didn't experience before. Um, And I think sometimes men can feel unwanted, Mm. undesired. You know, my wife really desired me before we had sex all the time or we had sex more regularly. And now this baby's here and the baby has all of her attention, or she doesn't seem to want me the same way anymore. So there's several co- factors that go to that. Mm-hmm. One, you mentioned the overall energy level, mm-hmm. just to exude that extra energy when really you just want to sleep. Or if you are holding a child all the time, breastfeeding a child, 
caring for children. They're on you. You're being your body, your body's physically being used consistently to Mm -hmm. take care of these children. Being physically touched one more time is really difficult. So what it feels like to a husband is rejection Mm -hmm. actually is just the fact of having some time to not be touched is a very desirable thing for women because they're consistently being touched. Yes. So giving your wife some time alone. And also if, how do I say this? Like being less selfish in your sexual, when you have sex, be less selfish with your wife. Like think about pleasing her instead of wanting her to please you in the ways that she did before she was up every three hours feeding a child and um, just really tired. And like you said, feeling like I'm having to give to this person and this person and this person. Well, now I have to give you what you want. And she may be feeling like, she's not getting any relief, any time alone, any satisfaction without having to give out more. Does that make sense? Yeah, and also having a postpartum body is not, it's hard to feel attractive. Yes. Um, So because you remember where things used to be or how they used to feel and things got stretched in all different directions. So being acknowledging that one of the, I think it was a huge disappointment probably to my husband is the fact that while I was nursing, I didn't want him to fondle my chest. Now my breasts were bigger than they'd ever been. So that maybe looked like an invitation. And so I very quickly let him know that I did not feel that that was an area right now that was like a feeding trough. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so that wasn't an area that made me feel sexy to be, to be to start leaking all over yourself yes, to like make you, you feel just, attractive. Yeah. So that wasn't a rejection of him. Mm-hmm. That was a place where my body was at. And as soon as he realized that, then it, it wasn't, he didn't take it as a rejection. But there's often that those conversations aren't being had. And so that right. person does feel like it's consistent rejection. And it's hard to have a conversation. It's hard to have a conversation and say, I don't feel attractive anymore Mm -hmm. because you're a little bit afraid your spouse is going to say, yeah, I don't think you are either. Yes. But they're not going to say that. No. I hope not. Okay. (laughs) If you were going to say that, don't say that. Don't say it. (laughs) That's a terrible thing to say. (laughs) Yeah. No, that you're absolutely right. It is hard to, hard to express the disappointment you're feeling at that time with, with how you look because of you don't want acknowledgement that they're feeling the same way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And women can also start to feel like, what's wrong with me? I'm not attracted to my husband anymore. Well, I I have zero. So I'm going back to, because I I did breast, I'm I'm hitting that breastfeeding thing Mm -hmm. because I feel like we don't talk about that enough and then women don't know what happened. My hormones were gone. Like Mm -hmm. there was nothing that was going to help me go anywhere during that time. And when I was done nursing, then I was able, I was back again. But because we had four children, my husband mm-hmm. did understand that each additional child that, that it's not that I even didn't want to please him, mm-hmm. but I needed to let him know, like if he had some expectation of me climaxing during the time I was breastfeeding, like it wasn't going to happen. Yes. I actually remember having a time when I, when I, said, I don't know what's wrong with me. I did think something was wrong with me. And the kids were really little. I don't remember if I was nursing at that time or not, but um, I kept thinking, what is wrong with me? What is wrong with my body? It was fatigue. I feel like a lot of it was just fatigue. Mm -hmm. But intimacy is so much more, more than sex. And so that's when... Um, non-sexual physical touch can really come into play because if you get to the point that you're only touching your spouse whenever it's a sexual nature and you want to have sex, you know what? That's going to make her feel like 
oh, stop touching me because, but maybe a back rub or just hold her hand or something that she would enjoy. Now she may be like, your gift to me is to not touch me and not let me see anybody. But, um, but I think the non-sexual touch comes into play there. Yeah, because nobody wants to feel used. Right. And that is yes. a huge roadblock to in- intimacy if someone's feeling used mm-hmm. in, in that scenario. So post-baby, there's a huge difference between... And even, you know, there are a lot of women that during their pregnancy, their hormones may co- go a couple different directions. Yes. There's certain trimesters that your hormones go different directions. So... If you are not talking about that with your spouse, that's also going to be a good chance they could be highly disappointed at certain times yeah. because there may be one thing that you they felt like you were just rearing and ready to go all the time. And then that changed as your hormones shifted as you were growing a child. Mm-hmm. So then we got into the post baby time. So moving past. Yeah. So then what does your sex life look like whenever you have young kids or you're moving into a new career and it's taking a lot of your time. Maybe you're traveling a lot, so you're not at home together as often. Um, I think sex starts to look different then too. Well, when you have little people that are in bedrooms near you, then that, it plays with your psyche. Mm-hmm. I mean, at least and it big did. people. And I mean, it's almost worse with big people. So actually, I was going to say that next, that that even got worse as they became teenagers and they were up at all times of the night. So therefore, you before, when they were little people and you knew you got them to sleep, you still had to get your brain past the fact that you had a child Mm -hmm. sleeping one room over. But when you have kids that literally can come and knock on your door at any hour, I, I might have told mm-hmm. this on the past podcast, but there was finally a realization that had to be said for to my kids during the time of COVID where we were all hanging out all the time and they their sleep patterns even got wacky because they were schooling from home. And I, I felt like they even crawled into bed. Like we had, like we were watching something on TV and so they would come and they would watch for a while and I couldn't get them away from my bedroom or away from my bedroom door. Like mm-hmm. they were just around a lot. They would bake brownies and then come and tell us about it or whatever, even though we were in bed. And I finally said, listen, guys, if our door is shut, you don't want to be near. And everybody yeah. like it, you know, my I didn't have it with I didn't have that conversation with my nine year old or eight, mm-hmm. however old she was at the time. But my Teenagers, like I felt like I finally needed to have that conversation because they were not allowing any time for us to have some private time together. And I knew that something had to be said. Yeah. Or we were going to, we were going to start probably fighting. Like it was going to become an issue between the two of us. I have a really hard time relaxing if I hear footsteps in the hallway outside my room. Mm -hmm. So my brain is not, cannot get into that space. Yeah. Okay, so you just said it's hard to relax. Well, that whole stage of life can be hard to relax whenever you are going in different directions and you're tag teaming it or um, one person's traveling and you're doing it alone. Like it can be really hard to relax if work is stressful or um, family relationships are stressful. Mm -hmm. So Ben knows that I don't even know what he said. He said something really hilarious about sex when there's a a number on the door. Meaning when we go to, we travel. If we go away (laughs) and we're in a hotel, then all of a sudden, Nicole, there's just something about Nicole that I'm not as uptight. Yes. When it comes to being intimate. Mm -hmm. And so when he said it, it just made me giggle because I didn't, it's like I didn't realize it was a thing. Like, yeah. Even though I don't know why, but once he said it, I was like, oh my gosh, it's so true that get me away from home or in a way from a place where A, there's tasks to be done consistently Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and there's people around and then I lighten up. And so therefore, like I'm probably more fun to be in bed with because of it. So I think that's really important to note to people because it is so hard to take all those things off your mind when you're in the same place where you have to process all those things. So getting away, even if it's for a night, mm-hmm. is so important. So important for your marriage. Yeah. I it is the game. It is the 
that's when it even gets more fun. And and I am a quality time girl too. So mm-hmm. like, so it also plays into my truly feeling like I'm getting close quality connection with Ben. So the conversations are better. We're connecting, we're jiving. So mm-hmm. I want to go ahead and step then into how conflict or stress can make a difference, even though you feel like it shouldn't be something that affects the bedroom. It does because I, because in all there's times that women, if they're not in the right headspace, Mm -hmm. they're not able to just, I know the idea of turning it off sounds fabulous, but that's not always the case. No. And sometimes you just can't turn it off. So there, there was a conversation that Ben and I had several years ago when we had some conflict going on. And because of it, I wasn't, um, I wasn't as loving as what I should have been Mm -hmm. as. So I think that what he was feeling is maybe I wasn't feeling attracted to him. Mm -hmm. Like, so what, what does he need to do? So how much harder does he need to work out in the gym or how many more miles does he need to run in order to be attractive to me? Mm -hmm. And when we finally had that conversation, I said, there is absolutely nothing about your physical appearance that changes my desire to connect with you sexually. It's how you speak to our family. It's how you come home with a grateful heart. It's how you love on other people outside of this household. It's how you conduct business. It's actually how you show up of the man of God that I desire you to be, that's actually what's really attractive. So he's like, so what can I do? And I said, honor God with everything you do. And that is so attractive to me. And he's like, wait a minute. So I don't, it has nothing to do with going to the gym. And I was like, nothing. It is totally about the way that you're living your life and that what fires my desire for you. Um, And that was a huge realization to him Mm -hmm. that he wasn't seeing what really lights my fire. Okay, let's play this out for a minute. So you have the husband who's wanting attention from his wife. And the wife is feeling, name, whatever she's feeling, unloved, undesired, um, not cared for. Maybe the husband's being a little... Uh, cold with her or like harsh with her. She's hurt. And so she's not feeling desirable or desired or, or she doesn't want to be intimate with him, but it has nothing to do with the way he looks. But what he's doing is he's working out and putting effort into his physical appearance in order to be more attractive, mm-hmm. which is what the wife isn't finding attractive. You come home and be nice to me. You smile you play with our children. You have dinner with us. That's what I want from you. Mm-hmm. But he's working out, probably looking better, and then starts getting attention from somebody else. Yeah. Oh, man. His 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 tank is empty. Mm-hmm. His tank is being filled by the wrong person. Mm-hmm. And then, well, my wife doesn't appreciate me. But this person makes me feel good about myself. So then he's not even wanting to put in to or figure out whatever his wife needs to fill her tank, you know, to feel loved. Well, it can happen so easily. Oh, and so fast. So fast. So I remember that back when we first got married, I don't know if I've told this story on the podcast, but we got a book and I don't know the exact title, but it was how to... It was something to the line of how to create an affair-proof marriage. Mm-hmm. And it was, I believe, also a faith-based book. Mm-hmm. And I was insulted. I mean, we're newlyweds. We are so in love. We are best friends. We're having a ball. And someone gifts me a book that says how to have an affair-proof marriage. I mean, to me, that was hooey. First off, that meant she didn't really know us, right? Because we're us. And we were not going to have an affair. And it just felt like a very un- insensitive gift. Now, as I've grown older, I've seen marriages around me crumble. I understand now that it could happen to 
anybody. Mm -hmm. Whether you're in the church, whether you've been married 10 years, whether you've been married 30 years, that if we are not being intentional with our spouses, that so easily it can happen. And so that gift now doesn't seem like an insensitive gift. Yeah. I feel like it's a really thoughtful gift. Mm -hmm. And so this situation that I just said for you of Ben was thinking, and he probably got to the point where he was like, screw you. Like I'm working so hard and you mm -hmm. are not even showing interest in me. And in my mind, it had nothing to do with the way he physically looked. It was more of my desire for him in a different era of the way he was right. showing up with the people in his life and the mm -hmm. people around him. Um, but because we hadn't had that conversation, that there's definitely a huge disconnect there. So that's a great point. We need to talk about our sex life. Yes. We need to talk about what feels good. We need to talk about what we don't like. We need to talk about how often we want to have sex, where we want to have sex, how we would like to have sex. We need to have those conversations. Do not have those conversations in your bedroom. No, at the time that you're having. At the time uh, that you're having sex. Yes. Like, you need to ha have that conversation outside of the bedroom, but have it. And tell your spouse, where do you want to be touched? What do you want them to do? So Ben is totally going to listen to this and he's be like, are you listening, Nicole? Are you listening to Dee Dee? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Ben. I am listening. <laughs> but you can discover your bodies together. Yes. Because there are changes that happen in the female body during sex that I can't see, but Ken can see. And so when you have conversations around what's happening in your body, too, then that brings this level of intimacy and closeness that is a little bit hard to describe, but it's something that you and your spouse get to experience together. And removing, we talked, we've had a sex podcast before. We got into some things that I think we talked about shame. I think we talked about the mm -hmm. way that Hollywood sets up. Yeah. And disappointment. that's why these conversations are helpful because we... You know, I'm, I'm speaking to the choir right now I'm not I'm, because I don't think Ben and I talk about this enough. And I hope right. that what from the, today, this conversation with you will trigger our conversation. I, I know it will when mm -hmm. I go home and have a conversation with him about what our podcast was about today. But what it is, is when it becomes something that you're not talking about, then it's something that you're only talking about in your head. Yes. And that is not that's not a good place for those kind of things to harbor. Right. Um, because there's a couple of things that come out. A, you're feeling like a failure, whether you're the husband who your wife is not um, responding to or the wife who doesn't have the desire to respond. Or, you know, we talk a lot about uh, the husband. I'm like glad being, you're going to bring this up. Yeah, that we was... talk a lot about the husband being the one that has um, feeling rejected. Yes, but there is definitely yes. um, times in marriages that the wife is the one that is wants to pursue. Yes. And, and and there's even people that have different sex drives. Like all of us are mm -hmm. created differently. So therefore the wife is the one that is desiring to be acknowledged by her husband and the husband is feeling the same sort of disappointments or the same sort of frustrations. Um, they may be emotionally disconnected. They may be stressed out at work. They may be feeling like they're failing their family. Mm -hmm. um, they tired, unhealthy. You know, all those things can play in there. And then the the wife is feeling... Rejected. Rejected. And, and undesirable. And undesirable. And they then also... So they want to seek... Um, just being able to feel physically loved by someone. Mm -hmm. To have an excitement around being with someone. You can have that with your spouse. When you've been married, I'm sure you could have that. When you've been married 40 years, 50 years, I guess. I don't know. I haven't been married that long. But you can also, you're also going to have times in life in your marriage 
where you're just not as attracted to that person physically. But it doesn't mean you stop having sex. Mm -hmm. Like, sexual intimacy is so important in a marriage. You can't use it as a weapon. Mm -hmm. You can't just say, well, I don't feel like doing it. Like, this is one of the times where it kind of doesn't matter what you feel like. At some point, you're going to have to have sex with your spouse. But talk about it. Mm -hmm. Say, I don't know what's going on with me, but if you if you don't know what's going on, but I am just not feeling like I want to have sex at all. And try something new. Try a new position. Or so so often we think of sex as just intercourse, but there's so much, so many other sexual experiences you can share with your spouse. And so sometimes you might not want to have sex. You need to do it anyway. Because if you go a month and you're like, yeah, I just don't want to have, he's on my nerves. She's irritating me. That's not going to help the relationship. I think also we need to realize that it sex isn't our secret. So it's really good that we're talking about it because there's sometimes that we need to seek out some seek out counsel. Mm -hmm. And it may be a health reason. Um, I just recently have been plugged into a program that helps with like pelvic floor dis, you know, dysfunction mm -hmm. or whatever. Being realizing some of the things that I just resigned to on I've had four kids, like it is what it is, doesn't have to be that way. And seeking out assistance can, with pelvic floor dysfunction, can also help mm -hmm. um, sexual comfort, sexual desires. And so for us to say, so so I guess what I'm saying right here is, is that so often, I think when sex lives tend to become stagnant, mm -hmm. couples are like, it is what it is. We've yeah. been married this many years. And what we need to really plug into is that it can be anything we want it to be now. Okay. So let's go, let's go beyond because I think that also when you get into postmenopausal sex, mm -hmm. then you're also dealing with new hurdles that you didn't deal with early in your life. Um, desire is a huge hurdle that you could be dealing with. Um, overall function of, for example, the way your body naturally lubricates itself or, and so there are, as you walk through these, walk through these different time periods in our life, then in order to make adjustments and it's, so it's not going to be the same when you're 20 as it is when you're 50. Mm -hmm. And so if, and if you think it is, we're setting ourselves up for failure. Yes. But also if you are in your 60s, in your 70s, and of course, I'm not speaking from somebody that's been there, but of conversations I've had, then it's so important to continue to have those conversations with your spouse mm -hmm. so that it may be that you're, when you're that age, you're not having the same amount of sex that you had when you're 50 because it's not the same, but having those conversations with your spouse so that you're both feeling aligned and comfortable in that situation. If it just becomes one person harbors, my best years are behind me, mm -hmm. and the other person is feeling like I'm not desirable to them anymore, but really there's a physical issue why they're feeling that way, if they're not having that conversation, then somebody's feeling super rejected. So I had lunch a couple of months ago with a lady, and we were talking about whatever topic, and sex came up, and she said, girl, when it comes time for you, get the patch. She has gone through menopause, and she's talking about some over-the-counter hormone patch that she gets from the drugstore. And she's in the medical profession, so I guess it's safe. I, don't, I do know what the patch is, because, and I'll tell you why. But um, I was like, really? She goes, oh my gosh. It's better than when we first got married, because I have that same desire, but we know each other so well. Mm. So there's, so there's this um, comfort level, 
with having conversation around our sex life and what we want and what we want to try. And, and you don't feel inhibited anymore by children or work or maybe insecurity around newness or discovering something, something in your body. She's like, girl, get the patch. Then it wasn't, it was maybe a week later. I was at lunch with a group of ladies I have lunch with each month and sex came up again. And I said, and we started talking about whatever. I promise I don't talk about sex all the time, but it just came up a couple of times. And, um, and this one lady said, well, I could, I could care less if I ever had sex again. And I said, you don't like having sex with, with your husband, I almost said his name. You don't like having sex with your husband? She was like, I just don't have any desire to have sex with him. She was like, I love him so much. And I like, I want him to know I love him. But when we do have sex, he can even tell, like, I am not into it. I just don't feel it. And I was like, okay, let me get the name of this patch. So I got the name of the patch and I sent it on to her. She went and picked it up that day. And the reason was because she loved her husband so much, she wanted to physically desire him. And she's older. And I thought, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Like, I loved that. And I loved that we broke down borders and started having conversations around sex and around around orgasms and around not having orgasms. And we've talked a lot about what ladies go through, but men go through changes too. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so important for men to talk, for us to create a space where our husbands can talk with us about this. Mm -hmm. And husbands, it's so important that you talk to your wife about this. Like if you're having a hard time getting an erection, if you're having a hard time ejaculating, like that can feel disappointing to a man. And it can make you feel like you're not desired by your wife and make you shut off or turn to something else. Maybe you start to turn to porn Mm -hmm. thinking that's going to help. That never helps. Like never helps. We need to do an entire episode on how dangerous porn is to a to a mm-hmm. marriage, yes. how dangerous it is to our psyche mm-hmm. and what it physically does to our brains. It's not a good thing. So, and women, we need to, as we all get older and as we go through different stages of life, we need to be gracious with the changes in our own bodies and the changes with our spouse's body, but not talking about it is only going to make it worse. And sometimes too, I think like with the ejaculation with men, they may feel like, what's wrong with me? Why can't, why can't I ejaculate right now? I'm, am I old? Maybe. Well, if you're on vacation and you've had sex multiple times in a short amount of days, well, you're, you're just spent. It's okay, but don't think you have to keep going to the point of ejaculation because your wife is getting sore. Like that's a really sensitive area and be mindful of that. And women, you need to speak up and say, this feels really uncomfortable right now. And learning to be okay with not having that sexual encounter play out like you think it should in your mind. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense because I think overall, I mean, you brought up different things that men go through. They just feel like they should be able to fill in the blank. So therefore, failure kicks in. And we've talked about it before with females because we don't, we've never really taught, are taught how the female body really works. Mm -hmm. Like, And so we should be able to just do what we see on television Mm -hmm. and we're not having those conversations. Yeah. I actually hate how taboo this subject is because it hinders 
healthy families and healthy marriages. So I feel like the enemy wants this subject to be taboo. He doesn't want people talking about it. So people are stay in a state of being unsatisfied. You know, I am feeling disappointed mm -hmm. and feeling like a failure. Yeah. And so even if you're in a place right now that you feel unsatisfied, if you feel like we don't have it right, we suck at this. And what the idea sometimes comes to mind is if I was with someone else, oh yeah, mm-hmm. then we then it would be better if I could restart or if I could be with someone that is then therefore that would be better. And that is the continued lies that the enemy wants us to have in our conversations in our head instead of being like if I start having these conversations with my spouse, if I seek out ways that um, we that we both can be satisfied if we ex- spend time pouring into each other and have conversations about what flips our trigger, then therefore we could start, you know, growing closer together. But it's almost like we, the distraction in the world is telling us that there's something better out there. You brought up so many good points right there. So first of all, If you had sex before you got married to your spouse, it is easy to think, when I had sex with this person, it was so much better. Okay, well, you're not living with that person 20 years later with children and with the stresses of life and with aging. Like, that is a dangerous, dangerous road. But so many people go down that rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. And... You hear it in conversations, like on and on, just in public. And the other day I was in a coffee shop, in a coffee shop, and there were these two ladies. At, they both appeared to be married. And one of them was talking about how she had looked up her high school boyfriend on Facebook and started talking about what it was like having sex with him. And I wanted to say, girl, he is not married to you. You did not have children with him. Like you are going down a really bad path right now. Just stop. Mm -hmm. Just stop. And she's talking about it in a coffee shop. Like other people were around. And I thought, do you not live in this town? Because somebody's going to tell your husband, you know, but I, I have no idea who she was. But I thought if she's talking about it there with a friend, she's been thinking about it for a very long time. And I think that is really common. It's always better somewhere else. Well, and also, so premarital sex also has the adrenaline boost of doing something wrong Mm -hmm. or something risky. Mm -hmm. So there's that additional adrenaline boost of, of being sneaky kind of thing that when you get, all of a sudden you get to your marriage bed and a lot of times you have to battle that because the wrong and risky of premarital sex, then you, it's hard to make the shift to what God intended for marriage mm-hmm. because we're used to doing the wrong and risky. So, but that type of adrenaline boost, A, is not sustainable and healthy long-term. Like that, that takes us down different roads. And then sin is multiplied is Mm -hmm. what often happens. But making that comparison to what is good and wholesome and been created for us versus what we were trying to sneak in, uh, there, there really is no comparison. Making a comparison to a partner before marriage, to something you see in a movie, to watching porn, how somebody's, you know, um, what's the word I'm trying to say? Like performing, performing in porn. What you read in a book. I have intentionally not read Fifty Shades of Grey Mm -hmm. for a reason, because I don't want to compare fiction to the blessing that I get to live with. You know, and if you are having sex with your spouse and you're thinking of other things, 
you're not seeing that person. You're not seeing that gift that God gave you. You're not seeing the beauty of the relationship that you could have. And furthermore, if there was violation during that time or pressure or you were stuck into a situation you didn't want to be in or it grew very um, hard or ugly during that time, not having those conversations about that later on Mm -hmm. can also be a huge hindrance to your marriage. Because if you felt forced to whatever, previous Mm -hmm. to your spouse, and then you come into your sexual relationship with your spouse and your spouse is exploring things which are very natural Mm -hmm. and yet takes you back to a place where you felt violated And your spouse doesn't understand that or know about it because you haven't had those conversations. That's really unfortunate. Yes. And that can also end up taking you to a place where your spouse feels disconnected from you completely. Mm -hmm. And then eventually that relationship is not nurtured anymore. Yeah. You're, You're right because you could immediately be triggered by something and you clam up. And your spouse thinks you're rejecting them. Yes. Yeah. So our bodies are going to change. Mm-hmm. Our bodies are going to change. And our mindsets change. The nature of our life changes. Sometimes we experience extreme loss. And then it's hard to find that intimacy. Yeah. I think that ultimately being able to feel connected with your spouse so that you're able to talk about these things, that you're able to see where they're at and realize that that is, it is a love, it is the most loving thing you can do f- with them and for them. Mm-hmm. And being able, if you're not there, then having those conversations. Because ultimately, if you're not intimate and you're not talking, then really you are you're not relating to your spouse at all. There, mm-hmm. there, there is a stagnant and potentially a dead relationship there. Yeah. Cause, so there are different levels of intimacy, pillars of intimacy that have to be present in our marriage relationships. And if they aren't, then our foundation that our relationship is built on is going to crumble. Mm-hmm. And our sex life is one of those pillars. It's not the only pillar of intimacy, but it is a very significant pillar of intimacy. So also plugging into other people. So one of the things we both like is the One Extraordinary Marriage podcast. Yes. It's fantastic. Um, they really break down the barriers of this of these conversations and it, it's relatable. They also have a magazine. I think it's called The Position Magazine that has different stories each month, but it also shares a different position that you can practice with your spouse. In order to get to that point, though, you really have to have um, some intimacy in your quality time together and your communication together. So spend that time. Recreational intimacy is so important. Go do something fun with your spouse. If you might think that you don't love your spouse anymore, just go do something fun with them. Enjoy. Just laugh together. Mm -hmm. And then that sexual intimacy, that sexual desire will start to come back. And if that's not happening, then seek out counsel. Yes. I mean, you know, like I think that one of the biggest mistakes that we make is feeling like we have to be ready to sign those divorce papers before we end up in an office where we talk things through. Mm -hmm. So seeking out counsel where you can work through some of those things. I feel like it's, it's good anytime. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Luckily I am also surrounded by people that I seek out wise counsel for, but um, being able to have somebody that just steps in there and so that, is able to guide that conversation so that you're able to open up and have that conversation. Um, It could be a game changer. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad we had this conversation, that we opened this topic, that we got to start thinking about what sex looks like in different stages of marriage, in different stages of life. We kind of broke, hopefully broke down some fears or some answered some questions of, 
is something wrong with me? No, nothing's wrong with you. It's just life. And if you aren't married, I think we gave you a lot to think about. So listen to what we said about how sex before marriage could affect that marriage relationship, but also be prepared for the different changes that'll come in life. And we haven't even scratched the surface. I mean, we could do four or five episodes on this one topic alone and not run out of things to talk about. But um, we thought it was important because we really want you to feel connected with your spouse. And if you're not married, we want you to start thinking about those things so that if you do decide to get married in the future, these things aren't a surprise. So if you want to increase the intimacy in your marriage, come to our marriage retreat. It'll be August the 27th and 28th in Charleston, South Carolina. I think it's a very romantic city. Maybe it's the city of love in the South. Um, I don't even know if that's what it's called. Um, But come to our marriage retreat. We would love to have you. It's going to be a weekend where we have a speaker that's going to pour truth into our marriage. We're setting it up to really increase intimacy, to invigorate marriages. And we pray that you walk away hopeful that you can be even closer to your spouse than you ever imagined. So go to www.liveyourdesign.life. Go to our events page and you can sign up right there and find out all the information about the retreat. And if you have any questions, there's a contact us section where you can send us your questions and we will get back to you quickly. 